make sure I describe this properly. So next up, we have the team from ING has come a long ways uh, to present on uh, a project that's uh, near and dear to R3's heart because uh, it's been uh, something that we've been very engaged with for a while now, which is H H -Q HQLAX, so high, qu high quality liquid assets. So uh, they've been hard at work uh, for a some time now actually developing their core app. So I think they're gonna run through this in detail today. So please welcome up the team from ING. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Kees van Eyck. I'm here together with uh, my colleague, Raoul Bujang. We're both uh, CTOs of HQLAX. It's a uh, distributed uh, uh, role, and we try to reach consensus on all the major uh, uh, technical decisions. Um, we both work for, uh, for ING. Um, yeah, waiting for the slide to pop up. We're both working for, uh, for ING, and the fact that we as ING employees are CTOs of uh, HQLAX, it illustrates the close cooperation between HQLAX and, uh, uh, and ING. In fact, the whole tech team of uh, HQLAX is uh, ING uh, personnel. So all the technology is, is uh, uh, developed by ING. Um, we'd like to cover uh, HQLAX, what it is, what it does, what the, uh, how the application works. Uh, and as soon as we have covered that, then we'll also explain uh, how we build it, which uh, decisions we took, um, yeah, the solution architecture, our experiences with Corda, and the next steps. Um, but before we get there, uh, I also have some questions for you. I'd like to see who we have in the audience. Um, who of you is involved in securities trading? May I see some, uh, some hands? Yeah, quite a few. OK, that's, uh, that's good. Um, and who of you has an IT background? OK, also uh, quite a few. That's, uh, that's a good match. And of those of you who have an IT background, who of you actively programs code? Also a few, that's good. That's a great match because um, uh, this talk uh, explains the, both the functionality and the inner workings of HQLEX. Let's start with uh, the functionality of HQLEX. In order to understand the purpose of HQLEX, um, I'd like to go back in time, um, 10 years to be, to be precise, to um, early March 2008. Early March 2008, I was on a ski trip. And after a long day of ski, we were having dinner with um, my friends and family. And two of the persons there, they said, Case, do you own any stocks? I said, yeah, just, uh, yeah, not super much, but uh, a few. They said, well, you better make sure you sell them all, because there's this huge crisis upcoming. Well, I, th I said, yeah, I heard occasionally in the news uh, something with the subprime mortgages or something like that. They said, yeah, it's exactly that. Uh, it's, uh, there's a big crisis upcoming. And we all know what happened next. Uh, in the, the fall of 2008, uh, the, the big financial crisis uh, started. Um, and the crisis uh, resulted in um, yeah, a, a lot of new uh, regulations uh, to make the financial system more stable. And that's where HQLAX uh, comes in. Because um, uh, uh, one of the things, uh, one of the, the measures to make uh, the financial system more, more stable is that um, the banks need to meet uh, a certain liquidity coverage ratio, or LCR. Um, since 2015, banks need to meet a 100% uh, uh, LCR. Um, which means they need to have a certain amount of securities on their balance sheet. And the LCR not only expresses the amount of securities that needs to be on the, on the balance sheet, but also the quality of the uh, securities. Uh, for instance, um, if a bank owns uh, government bonds from a financially stable country, like German government bonds, 
they regard it as high quality liquid assets. And uh, when a bank owns, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, primarily uh, mortgage-backed securities, they regard it as a lower, um, a lower quality liquid asset. Well, um, because of the uh, um, uh, commercial activities of, of different banks, some banks have a surplus of high quality liquid assets, and other, one, and other ones have a shortage of high quality liquid assets, which is why they're being traded on marketplaces, and which is why they're being settled on HQLX. That's where HQLX comes in as a post trade settlement system for high quality liquid assets. HQLAX started out as Project Bravo, an R3 project um, run by uh, uh, four banks, ING, UBS, Commerzbank, and uh, CIBC, and it runs on Corda. If you look at the, the current situation, to manage your, uh, uh, your liquidity and to swap DCRs, low, uh, to swap uh, uh, assets, high quality liquid assets versus low quality liquid assets, you see we're facing a fragmented marketplace. Um, it's slow to move um, uh, uh, securities from one bank to the other. Uh, basically, the securities are moved from one account to another account. It's inefficient because of reconciliation. And because it's fragmented, slow, and inefficient, it's also quite expensive to meet your LCR. That's where HQLAX comes in. We're using Corda, distributed ledger technology, to have real-time swaps. And that's also because we have a different operating model. We don't move the securities from one account to another. Instead, the securities stay stationary, and we create a digital collateral receipt, which um, uh, changes ownership on Corda. Yeah, so the ownership of the digital collateral receipt is recorded on Corda and changed on Corda. Um, yeah, uh, uh, therefore it makes uh, for a more efficient uh, uh, marketplace, therefore reducing the costs of the uh, um, liquidity uh, uh, management. Using a Corda also enhances the transparency and therefore gives yeah, uh, more information to the regulators, real time, and with a full transaction history. Um, yeah, because meeting LCRs becomes more uh, efficient, we mitigate systemic risks. And last but not least, all of this is supported by a legal framework, which is in place and tested in our most recent live trade. So how does it work? Well, obviously, it requires two parties an HQLA giver and an HQLA, ex, uh, HQLA receiver. And so one bank who has a surplus of high quality liquid assets and the other has a shortage. Um, both banks, they um, give their assets, their securities to a custodian. Um, they create digital collateral receipts, um, which are stored on Corda. The custodian confirms that there is indeed an inventory, a confirmed inventory. And then these uh, uh, DCRs can be swapped, uh, uh, they swap ownership. Uh, we do that in one Corda transaction. So there's an atomic swap of an HQLA uh, uh, asset versus a non-HQLA asset. That's the actual exchange. This is the, uh, the user interface. Um, here you see basically three DCRs. And we have the, the principles of uh, a 25 million and um, uh, a 1 million uh, haircut, uh, which is applied. Because uh, um, if you use a, a, a low quality liquid asset, then it can't. Uh, um, if you have a high quality liquid asset, you can use the total amount of it, uh, say for instance um, 25 million, you can use that in your LCR calculation. 
Instead, if you have a low quality liquid asset, you cannot calculate the full uh, amount, yeah, but you must apply a reduction to it. Uh, we call that reduction a haircut. And to make that um, represented in the swap, we add a uh, third DCR to the transaction, which is a smaller one, uh, the bottom one, which is applied as a haircut. So why did we choose Scorda? Well, let me first explain why we chose uh, to use DLT in the first place. Um, first thing is to create a standardized marketplace, uh, marketplace instead of the fragmented marketplace that we have today. We uh, connected uh, multiple, uh, um, uh, we, we, we want to connect multiple uh, uh, custodians and multiple marketplaces to have one uh, uh, standardized uh, marketplace. There's the uh, real-time view, the tracking view for the, for the regulators. We um, create consistency and transparent data across all market participants. And as obvious as this sounds uh, uh, to, to, to most of us who are familiar with distri distributed ledger technology, um, before DLTs, this was not so obvious. And in fact, um, recently we talked to an, a new business partner that we wanted to connect to our system. And they asked us, but uh, in your APIs, where is the end of day API? And we want to invoke it to do the reconciliation. Now, we had some explanations to do there. <laughs> you have a copy of your distributed ledger. You can trust that copy. Everybody has the same copy. So um, no need for reconciliation. There's consistency and transparency across all participants. Um, it's a low volume, high value use case, uh, which typically is a good match for, for DLT. But then the main question, why do we use Corda? There are so many out there. Uh, there's a, a, a Ethereum, Quorum, Fabric. Um, let me start with the uh, pluggable consensus. And though, uh, if you start with, with Ethereum, we did many uh, experiments with Ethereum. Um, though you can easily build applications with Ethereum, uh, and though it officially has pluggable consensus, in practice, the only way to use it is with uh, proof of work. Then another one which comes in is um, a Quorum. It's basically Ethereum, but then changed to also be able to plug in different uh, types of, of consensus algorithms. For instance, uh, uh, they have their own proprietary one, quorum, quorum chain. There's Raft. Um, there's an, uh, a BFT uh, um, consensus algorithm also available for, uh, uh, for Quorum. And Quorum even has private transactions. That said, um, yeah, the, the private transactions in Quorum, it means that transactions are sent only to specific uh, uh, participants in the network, only those involved. But in Quorum, it has one big downside, which means that those transactions are no longer validated and there's no longer explicit consensus on private transactions in Quorum. Whereas in Corda, um, there's also selective multicasting of the transaction, so only those parties involved in the transaction uh, receive it. But there is notarization and there is a consensus on those uh, transactions. So that's a big, big difference. Um, so why not use Hyperledger Fabric then? Well, uh, Hyperledger Fabric also has its um, uh, privacy features called uh, uh, channels. A uh, channel is you define uh, for a fixed set of participants who are going to exchange messages. And it works well if you have, for instance, uh, two banks that do a lot of payments back and forth. And it's a static group, that's just these two banks. But if you have a marketplace and you have many um, uh, parties in that marketplace, all transacting with each other, and it's also a very um, uh, a variable number of, uh, uh, of people. Uh, uh, parties can enter the marketplace or exit. Uh, in that case, a, a fabric channel is not a good, uh, uh, a good match. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, the selective broadcasting 
of the transactions in, uh, in Corda, uh, together with uh, Intel SGX. That's uh, a major uh, benefit and a very good match for our application. Um, and last but not least, Corda is designed with input from major financial institutions, um, also our input. Uh, for instance, we participate in the architecture working group. Um, so this year we aim for production. Uh, uh, 2016 was all about the, uh, uh, the ideas. Um, 2017, uh, starting with the incubation phase, and then um, uh, halfway 2017, HQLX was, uh, was uh, started. So a separate uh, company, a separate entity, a fintech startup, which pushes um, HQLX to production. Most recently, um, last uh, end of, uh, of uh, January, we conducted a live pilot, a live trade on HQLX. And before the end of the year, uh, we're going into production with our minimum viable product. The platform uh, currently runs on Corda uh, V2.0. Uh, we plan to upgrade uh, as soon as new versions come, uh, come available. Um, we do uh, DCR management, um, scheduling and maturing of, uh, of swaps, including haircuts. Um, it's deployed on testnet. We have multiple banks uh, uh, connected. Like I said, we performed a live trade. Um, the powerful thing about this trade was, was that there was a legal framework in place, which means that um, we are a, uh, capable of legally transferring titles of digital collateral receipts. And this was also um, uh, proven by the fact that after we changed the legal ownership of the uh, DCRs, and therefore the underlying assets, the underlying uh, um, Dutch government bonds and, and German government bonds, after we changed that ownership, the new owners were able to take out the securities from their uh, uh, inventory box at the custodian, uh, which also proves that the custodian recognizes the new ownership which was recorded on Corda. Uh, so it's both legally uh, proven, but it's also uh, proven that the custodians uh, recognize it. Um, yeah, we did it on a dedicated Corda network, PilotNet. So how does the solution look like now that we know what HQLAX does? Um, here you see the different roles we, we see on the network. And there's banks uh, signing their trades. There's the, the marketplace, which is uh, outside HQLAX, and proposing a new trade, which is then signed by banks. Regulators, who have a, a, a real-time view. Um, and custodians, who confirm the uh, inventory of the DCRs. This is what a core transaction looked like. So and, um, uh, you see three DCRs again, two principles of 20 million. And you see that bank A has level one, which is high quality. Bank B has level 2A, which is low quality uh, uh, liquid assets. The principal amounts are 20 million, but bank B, uh, because of its lower quality asset, it needs to add 5%, a 1 million uh, uh, haircut DCR. These DCRs, the three, are uh, atomically swapped. Um, yeah, we're, we're uh, currently working on the uh, uh, on pledging them as well. Well, we had some key design considerations. Uh, uh, most importantly, the uh, uh, confidentiality: who can see what. If a bank uh, swaps a DCR, if Bank A swaps with Bank B. And then bank B would do a forward landing or a swap with bank C. Then C would see, bank C would see the complete transaction history from bank A to B to C, which is something we don't want. Uh, so uh, uh, therefore, um, we don't allow forward landing uh, uh, currently. Then we considered what to store on the ledger and what not. Well, obviously. Uh, we store DCR and trade-related information, uh, the states of the trade, 
Is the DCR confirmed by the custodian? Uh, is it swapped or not? Has it matured? Uh, but the other one is um, not so obvious. Uh, uh, the, the static information, which is not state uh, sensitive, for instance, the ISINs of the underlying securities. Uh, the more of that static information that you store on the ledger, the more uh, uh, strict business rules you can enforce. But then again, you also make the uh, system less um, uh, flexible. Uh, if you want to uh, onboard new parties that have different business rules, et cetera, et cetera, you could say we keep the system very clean, just record the ownership, and then it's more, uh, more flexible and reusable. Um, we chose to store ISINs. Then who signs what? Uh, well, would it be significant, uh, sufficient if um, uh, only both traders sign, uh, both banks? we feel it makes sense that also the notary signs uh, for consistency and integrity of the system. Um, yeah, the setup of R3's testnet, um, you see that uh, the banks and the custodian, they interface with the system through uh, user interfaces. And we provide uh, REST APIs, which can be invoked by the user interface, but they can also be invoked by um, uh, uh, back-end systems uh, of a bank, but currently for the pilot, we're interfacing with uh, user interfaces. And there's a regulatory note for the, for the real-time view of the system. So the key roles of Corda and HQLEX is to record and track DCR ownership, the atomic delivery versus delivery of DCRs, enforcing business rules, um, uh, for instance, only uh, confirmed DCRs can swap. Create consistency and transparency. Enforcing digital signatures. And to give regulators a real-time view. The deployment of HQLAX uh, typically contains two parts. There's the Corda node, um, yeah, what you see in the, in the middle. And on the left side, you see a web server. The web server talks RPC to Corda, and it talks REST API to uh, whoever consumes the service, for instance, the user interface, or it can be connected to the backend systems of a bank. Hello? Thank you there you go. Thanks. <coughs> um, yes. So in, in, in the current um, setup, we use a, a non-validating notary because we don't want to um, um, share the transaction details with the uh, notary necessarily. Um, that might change if we use, uh, um, if SGX becomes available, it would no longer be a, a, an immediate concern and then we might switch to a, a validating notary, which has uh, some advantages too. But right now it's a non-validating notary. Um, Performance um, was discussed this morning, and it was actually um, quite close to our own experience. Um, HKLAX is a nice sort of DLT use case uh, because we deal with a fairly low volume but very high value transactions. So at this point in time, um, we're aiming for hundreds of transactions per day um, with high value. Uh, but but the, uh, the overall per day volume is actually quite uh, low. And also the, the latency requirements are not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not hard real time. It's um, um, settlement on, you know, um, transactions committing in, in, in times on the order of seconds is not a problem for this use case. So it's quite easy to, um, to work with the current performance of, uh, of Corda. Um, and, and so far it hasn't been a, uh, an issue. Now, we haven't done any uh, large-scale deployments yet, and we haven't uh, um, done extensive performance testing, but current performance with the current scale has been, has been adequate. Um, and, and we're confident that um, uh, we will meet requirements going forward. So privacy and confidentiality in HKLAX is, is uh, Actually, a fairly tricky issue. Um, we're dealing with uh, trades um, that are very high in value and that uh, contain you know, uh, information that is uh, you know, potentially sensitive. Um, 
And in Quora, um, when you have a token that you, you put on the ledger, and a DCR is essentially a, a tokenized basket of securities, uh, when you trade it and you move it from one owner to another to another to another, um, you sort of bring along your history. And that history of transactions contains sensitive information. So um, when I pass a, a DCR2 case, you know, it's, it's normal that we know about the trade that we're doing. But then if Case would forward lend the DCR that he received from me to someone else, then that someone else need not know about the details of our trade necessarily. And with Quota, if you don't do anything, then the transaction chain can be, can be followed and you could see that information potentially. <coughs> um, now there's a couple of things you can, you can do. Um, right now in HQLIX, um, for multiple reasons, not just privacy, we simply do not allow forward lending. So parties can uh, exchange a DCR and uh, you know, after a while the uh, ownership will uh, revert and, um, and, and that's, that's it, uh, basically. But when I lend something to Case, he's not allowed um, to lend it on to someone else and that's enforced by the, the smart contract. Now the reason for that is not just privacy, the other reason is that the business rules with forward lending are quite a bit more complex than with, uh, without forward lending. <coughs> um, it turns out that even without forward lending, there are still some, some privacy issues in the, in, in the current system and uh, that we will have to address. Um, we can do that in, in, in different ways. Um, the, the, the simplest solution from our perspective is um, wait for SGX because it would address this. Um, the change would be, uh, the transaction chains would be passed on to the nodes, but they would be uh, processed in, a, in an unclap where the node couldn't basically see it. It could just learn if the chain was valid or not. Um, that would be one way of doing it. Um, the other way is to, um, in our case, we, we can solve it at the application level um, by basically ending the life cycle and then sort of reissuing uh, a token. And um, so that's something that's uh, uh, still open and needs to be done. Ah, yes, uh, I forgot something. So I, I, I focused on the, the content of the transaction. Uh, the other sort of uh, sensitive part is the identities of the uh, parties involved in the uh, transactions, especially if you do allow forward lending. Uh, you don't need to know the identities of all the parties in a lending chain. Uh, necessarily, and this is um, something where um, called us con uh, um, confidential identities could be used uh, to good effect. We haven't done that yet, um, but it is certainly an option. <clears throat> so I mentioned uh, SGX. Uh, with SGX, you can um, you basically uh, perform the validation of a transaction chain inside a, a secure enclave. Um, it's, it's really um, impressive technology, actually. Um, but you know, it also has some, some, some it raises some questions. Um, it requires some trust in Intel, um, requires um, special hardware. Um, there is some interaction with, with Intel. Uh, there's a, so, sort of a setup phase. And um, so it, it, it makes deployment potentially more complex and you sort of have to balance these things. Uh, are we gonna rely on a hardware solution where we, you know, we have, we have these issues potentially or are we going to solve this at the application level and, and you know, have to deal with, with more complexity at the application level? Um, I'll talk a bit about our experiences with Corda. Um, I personally worked with Corda since I think M3 or M4. Um, it's been a while. <coughs> um, case covered a lot of these um, uh, bullet items, so I won't go um, over all of them, but, but just highlight um, the main ones. Um, I think for me personally, one of the main uh, things is that uh, with Corda, we could just leverage uh, JVM technology, and that's actually a big, big plus, because it's not the JVM itself, it's not just the programming language, but it, it is all the tooling around it. Um, quite recently, we had to uh, uh, track down a bug. Um, and we can just use you know, the standard IDE, standard debuggers. Um, for some of the other platforms, uh, one of our team members actually wrote a debugger. And it's not something, you know, that, that's great and it's impressive that he could do that, but it's really not 
the thing that a blockchain team should be spending its time on. It shouldn't be writing debuggers. It should be writing um, blockchain applications. So that's all, all um, nice and, and good. Um, but there are also some, some, some things that are um, not so easy necessarily. Um, so I'll, I'll highlight a few of them. Um, <coughs> I think the, the first one applies not just to Corda, but, but to a lot of the uh, uh, DLT platforms. Um, but what I've seen, and, and, and um, I've been coding for quite a while, is, is that writing good Corda programs, or DLT programs in general, is just not easy. When you write a Corda application, you're essentially writing a, sort of a, well, a security protocol. And those are actually notoriously hard to get right, and, and Corda helps in many ways. Uh, the, you know, I, which I just attended one of the other talks where a speaker mentioned the, you know, all the um, existing out-of-the-box flows that, that help with a lot of stuff, and, and that's great. Uh, nevertheless, it is not hard to make mistakes, and it's not necessarily easy to um, um, let them go unnoticed. And again, it's not a Corda-specific thing. Um, you'll, you'll see this within other platforms too, but you have to think hard about who's going to sign what, who's going to verify what, and um, uh, you need to be very precise about the validation in your uh, smart contracts, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And another issue is that in Corda, um, you, have the, you have control over where you send your transactions. Um, the flip side of that coin is that um, you need to decide where you send your transactions, and, and you have to coordinate explicitly with the parties that um, you want to see the transaction. So there is, um, and that's different from, from um, platforms where you just, let's say Bitcoin, where you just broadcast your transaction and, and be done with it. There's not a lot of uh, coordination that uh, um, takes place in your programs there. <coughs> Um, UTXL is, is elegant, I think. Um, it does require some rethinking sometimes of your, your business logic. Um, I'll skip that for, for today. And, and the final point that I'll talk a bit more about is transaction verification. Um, some of the HKLAX transactions are, are, let's say, of modest complexity. Uh, they can't, logically, they, they consist of sub-transactions. So a swap is basically two, two transfers going in opposite directions. Right? And, and, and we'd like to actually express it in that way and verify it in that way. Um, and that's not always trivial. Um, so let's have a look at that. I'm going to skip this one. <coughs> so um, tr transaction verification is key because it protects the integrity of the ledger and it, it's what this is all about. Um, but it's not always simple when you have a complex transaction. So uh, a DCR swap can involve up to four DCRs, two to four DCRs, um, and there's a, a sort of life cycle management involved. So there is quite a few states involved. Um, and when you want to check the full transaction for, for a swap, and well, there's multiple types of transactions, um, there's actually quite a few checks. And it's, it's, it's it really is a lot, and it's, it's quite easy to get things wrong. And um, so what do you do? So I'll talk a bit about the things that we, we do and, and try to make these um, transaction verification things more modular um, so that it's just harder to make mistakes. Um, that's one, one sort of benefit. And the other uh, important thing for us is that it's, uh, um, it makes the verification logic reusable uh, across uh, different scenarios. So we do three things. We use state machines, transaction parsers, and uh, hierarchical checking. So um, this one's uh, uh, a bit technical, perhaps. Um, the state machines, let me see if I can. So let me start with this one. This is what a quota transaction uh, can look like. <coughs> so a transaction consists um, of commands of input states and output states, and each transaction uh, consumes zero more input states and produces um, zero more output states. Um, and that's nice. Now, if you, you write your first quarter program, you're um, 
you will typically express validation logic in terms of conditions on the relationships between inputs and output states. Now, in this transaction, there, in this transaction, there is five input states and uh, five output states, and it's you know you, you can have a lot of relations between those, and, and typically a state consists of multiple fields, and then you, you have to make sure that you know all the fields have the right values. It's um, and it, it, it quickly becomes quite messy. So we do three things, and the um, the first one is this thing called uh, state machines. <coughs> And what that does it, is it tries to um, simplify the life of the application programmer. The, the application programmer basically implements um, the state transitions by writing a state machine, which is a fairly standard construct for, um, for programmers. And um, so there is an example here for, let's say, you want to track on Ledger a set of permissions for access to some resource, for example. And there's a couple of actions you can take. And in this example here, you see two actions, revoke access and grant access. So we start in a particular state. And depending on the action taken, we go, uh, well, we go to the top left state or to the rightmost state. <clears throat> and that's something that you can easily express in code um, as a state machine. Now what we do is, well, we do exactly that. We write that state machine. And the state machine will verify the conditions that need verifying. So uh, when you revoke access, for example, uh, you may want to check that someone had access in the first place. And that's a con condition that you can check in your state machine. And um, what the state machine then does is when all the checks are OK, it produces the successor state. <coughs> Once you have that state machine, you can do two things. First, you can use it to build the transactions. Um, and that's what we do. Um, but interestingly, you can use the same state machine to verify your transactions. So what we do there is when a transaction comes in, we will receive something like this. <clears throat> and then what we do is when we have an, uh, um, an input state, we will apply the state machine to compute the expected output state. And then we compare it to the actual output state that we receive. And that's quite simple and elegant. And it means that we don't have to do field by field matching at the top level in the verification code. We just apply the state machine transition, which does checking, but which doesn't see the output state that we're checking against. We just produce the expected output. And then we check if it matches the output that we've received. And that's simple. So that's it's not exactly rocket science, but it's, it's worked well for us in, in multiple projects, and, and, and we like it. <clears throat> so the next thing that we um, did to simplify verification is something called uh, transaction passing. Um, again, if you look at this um, transaction here, you, you'll see it's, again, if you write your first quota program, when you do verification and you have a complex transaction like this, um, you will typically have to do verification on subsets of the states. For example, um, in this transaction, there is lots of um, sub-transactions. One is shown here. It's a pledge. And actually, if you want to see the full logical structure of this transaction, let me show it. <coughs> Logically, this is what's going on in this transaction. So we have. Um, um, at the bottom level, we have simple updates where you know, uh, an input is matched to an output. Um, these updates are used to represent either title transfers or pledges. So and as Case explained, in a DCR swap, you have um, at least two title transfers and um, potentially two pledges. <clears throat> and that's you know, reflected here. Um, now, logically, a title transfer can be paired with a pledge. So it gives you a transfer with a haircut. And at the top level, we're swapping two of these things. And, and this is sort of the logical structure of the transaction. That's not what we get when we verify a transaction. When we receive a transaction from another node, all we receive is this. And, and we can't, you know, we, but we want to verify at this level. Because when we have this, um, 
when we can do verification at this level, at, at the level of these nodes, the logical nodes, then it becomes easier to reuse the verification. Um, so transaction parsing is, is just a way to uh, basically recover this structure from this input. And we use a standard mechanism called just parsers, just like a, a parser for a programming language. Um, and, and we apply that same technology to parsing a transaction and recovering the state. So uh, these parsers, they operate from basically left to right in the transaction, consuming states and grouping them into you know, ever larger logical units. Uh, parsers can be combined uh, into uh, bigger parsers, so to speak. And that means that we can also reuse them. Uh, you see some, some code here that expresses the idea. There is a parser that consumes a single input state, a parser that consumes an output state. The two of them can be combined to, uh, uh, to produce a parser that logically uh, consumes a move subtransaction. And then when you have two moves, um, you can build a parser that consumes a swap transaction. <clears throat> In the end, uh, when you apply a parser to a transaction, it will give you this tree. Um, and that's nice, because that, that allows us to do the third thing, which is hierarchical checking. And, and that means that instead of applying all the checks that we need to do to that single transaction, we apply checks to each of the logical uh, nodes in this tree. And so for example, um, when you do a state update in, in Quota, if it's a linear state, there's basically one important condition. The input and the output state should be um, using the same linear ID. And that's something that we check at that level. <clears throat> one level up, once we have a valid state update, and if it's, uh, let's say, it's, a it's supposed to be a title transfer, well, when you transfer title, um, the important thing, well, one important thing is that the owner changes. You, you can't really title, you know, transfer title to yourself. So the owner has to change. And so that's something that's checked at the level of the title transfer. Um, and, that, you know, and, and that's nice, because now we have to write checks that only apply to the right level in the transaction. <clears throat> and, and the system is structured in such a way that um, when you receive a node, you know it's in, in a correct state and has already been checked. And so you only have to do the additional checks for the next, next level up. And here are some examples of the checks I mentioned a few. A linear ID should be the same sometimes. Owner should change uh, with the transfers. When you, when you have parallel transfers, they have to be between the same parties. When you have a swap, you also have parties that need to match. And so, so all these checks are sort of applied to the level that you're working at. Um, something else, this is our uh, you know, suite of tools. And um, it's really boring. And I think that's really good. Because it means that we can use standard technology. Um, and, and that's pretty much what we do. Um, I think you know, maybe the only exception is perhaps Kotlin. Um, pretty much every new developer on our team has to learn Kotlin. And uh, um, I doubt that very many of them will be happy to go back to Java. Um, <clears throat> and all the rest is, is standard. And, and that's just really nice for us. Um, we also use the, um, 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 the, uh, the marketplace on Azure um, and the quota package there. Um, that's right now is used to, to power our, our DevNet. We have a separate uh, quota network that we manage by ourselves. Um, and it's uh, separate from, dev, from DevNet. We use this for our um, um, standard testing. Um, and it was fairly easy to set up, and it, it's really paying off for us. Um, Case has already mentioned the, the live transaction. Uh, that was quite exciting for us, and, and I think for all the, the, the parties involved. Um, and we, we learned a lot from it. Um, Overall, I think it, you know, with respect to Quota, I think it was a, a positive experience. Um, it was easy for us to set up the nodes. Um, 
There were issues too, and, and some of those uh, are already being addressed. I think um, firewalling is probably the main, uh, sort of, the, the, what was probably one of the worst things. Um, the longest email chains in my mailbox at this point in time um, are related to getting the firewalls set up between the, uh, the huge number of parties in this uh, live transactions. I think we five, six nodes, and it's just enormously painful for, for people to set up firewalls on a point-to-point -point basis. And, and it, it's, well, I, 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 you know, I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but, but nobody wants to uh, do it that way. Um, we did that for the live transaction, but it's, uh, it's not the way to go. And, and, and the firewall float is a very uh, important development, I think. Um, the other thing is uh, we had network map issues. Uh, and again, I think the, uh, as far as I know, the network map code is, is being uh, completely rewritten. And uh, that should address uh, some of the issues that we had. <coughs> one thing, yes, one more thing is um, onboarding of, of, of new parties to the, to the network was on occasion a bit painful. Uh, a typical scenario was that a party would uh, um, get connected and they would get a certificate from Quora's doorman and everybody was happy, party was happy because they got their certificate, you know, they'd configured a node, all, all good. Um, I think R3 were happy, they'd handed out the certificate and everybody's happy and then nothing works. And quite frequently, this was a, a configuration error at the, uh, at the end of the party. Um, but what seems to be missing there is, is some sort of basic connectivity check um, that tells both that party and, and, and R3 that you know, the system's not just identifiable, but can actually perform transactions, uh, seize the network map, um, et cetera. That, that type of smoke testing would be really useful, I think. Um, the other thing, and sort of in the same area, is uh, um, for this live pilot, we had to deal with the banks, participating banks, infrastructure teams, um, which is typically not the DLT team. Um, but they were the guys, for example, setting up the firewalls. And they go, what, what do you mean DLT sometimes? And OK, fi yeah, firewall. I know how to do firewall. And, and, but what they really need is, is something like um, a one pager or a two pager with very clear instructions on what the system does um, at the platform level, um, ports to open up, ports not to open up. Um, and, and these sort of things, it, it, it just makes life easier, easier for everyone, I think. It's, uh, um, but yeah, it's, that, that's not exactly rocket science. And uh, in the end, it's, uh, I, th I think, an important thing, but, but a minor thing to fix. <coughs> so um, end of this year, we, uh, we want to have a, an MVP um, that's ready for um, uh, production use, and that's really, really challenging. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, Quota's not finished yet, um, and uh, we're, we're certainly at the application level not quite finished either. Um, there's a couple of big things coming up. Um, the big ones, so the, the biggest one here is uh, that's mentioned here is integration. Um, a couple of other ones are uh, well. I already mentioned the privacy issues. Um, there is, um, you know, Corda V3 and um, Enterprise Corda are going to come out and, and we'll have to um, make sure that everything runs fine on that. Um, but integration is, is really um, important and, and non-trivial. So <coughs> we go back to this image. You can see the integration points. <coughs> so there is the, uh, the custodian um, and then there is the banks. I've omitted the, uh, the front end, the trading front end, but that's another uh, integration point. And um, the way things have been um, done up to now is that um, we're not connecting, for example, to the bank's backend systems. So in the live transaction, we use uh, user interfaces, standalone user interfaces, to interact with the nodes. And that's, you know, that, that, that you know, as a, as a temporary uh, solution, that's fine. And it allows us to you know, play with all the aspects of the system. But in the end, you want to move to a system that's, or to a situation that's called full integration on, on the right-hand side, <coughs> where um, the quota node is, is basically connected, or, or the other way around, to, uh, to backend systems. 
<coughs> and um, that means that we have to go through all of the sort of production processes for a bank. And that, that's a, a, a big ex exercise, both for H HKLAX, um, but also for, for R3. Uh, because it means that um, it needs to be bank ready. And that means uh, going through all the risk processes, security processes, uh, monitoring requirements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a huge list. I've recently uh, collected all the documents um, for ING um, you know, that, that describe what needs to be done to go live. Um, it's a pretty big stack, and it, it's you know, and there is no nonsense in there, to, to be honest. It's uh, uh, so yeah, there there is a lot of work there uh, to be done, uh, but it is something that we're now actively uh, working on. Um, since we're we're ING employees, it's easy for us to to do this with uh, within ING. Uh, but of course, that's only one bank, and other banks have their own regulations. There's a lot of overlap, but it's not necessarily all identical. And that's um, where we are today. Um, so I, I think overall, our, our experience with Corda has been uh, really positive. Um, at the same time, um, it's important to realize that we're not there yet. Uh, um, and uh, I think uh, uh, it's really exciting. We, we're, we're hoping to, uh, to go live at the end of this year on, uh, on Corda and uh, to move things into production. Thank you. Um, and we do have a couple of minutes if anybody had any additional questions. Um, just five minutes between. Is there any questions? Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for sharing. I think it's always very helpful if, if people that actually do an experiment and try to move an application to production share their experiences because everybody's you know, trying to reinvent the wheel. So thanks for sharing. Um, I was wondering why you chose to keep the custodian. I'm sure there's a pretty good reason for it, but it would be valuable to learn what your considerations were. Yeah, so um, um, we need a party that uh, stores uh, or multiple parties can do this as long as they um, uh, all have uh, access to uh, Corda. Uh, we need a party to um, confirm that the DCRs are somewhere. The, the DCRs itself, uh, sorry, that the, uh, the underlying collateral uh, is indeed present, and it is represented by that DCR. Is that so, a requirement? Um, well, we do not store the, uh, the securities itself on, uh, on Corda. Uh, we have the, uh, yeah, the, the receipt of them on, uh, on Corda. I think things would potentially change if, if you know, the securities were issued on Ledger. Hmm. Yeah. So that's, 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 you know, we're so doing so one thing at a time. Themselves are represented by different systems, so you have to eventually replace each of those different systems. That's what it's today, yeah, with the multiple custodians. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to both of you. Thank great you. presentation. Sure.